So welcome to this video lecture. That will be a uncut video lecture on software delivery or some different methods to uh, deliver software to end users in a Windows environment. Uh, this lecture is part of the Windows administration course that I'm hold having at the University of Hovde and the lecture is with me, Joachim Sjöderstad. Uh, so as I said, this will be a bit uncut due to lack of time, but we will uh, try to just have a short presentation of some different software uh, delivery techniques and then we're going to dive a little bit uh, deeper into remote apps, uh, which is a feature that is available in Windows Server 2012. Um, so, to begin, so uh, software delivery, and what we're going to go through is a bit of introduction, then I'm going to briefly mention some different approaches, which is automatic installation, uh, Docker services, uh, software as a service, and then remote uh, apps. And then we'll, we'll go through a little bit of remote apps in practice, so I will show you how it's actually done, and how you can configure it, and how it looks to the end users. Uh, so, beginning, uh, bringing applications to end users is uh, sort of a cumbersome uh, experience because you do want a good mix of having good security for the end users, you want manageability for the IT department, and you also want to be able to give the users a good experience. And there are, it might si sound easy to yes, to deploy, I don't know, the office package to the end users, but if you, especially if you go to into looking at other applications and maybe more uh, user-specific or service-specific application, there are some issues that you need to uh, be aware of. Uh, the first one is, of course, platform compliance. So all all different all different types of uh, applications will not be able to run on any platform. There is, of course, the classical issue of Windows, Linux, Mac uh, compatibility, but there is also a, a platform compliance issue in between ver versions of different pr different programs. So it might not be sure uh, certain that an application that runs on Windows 10 can run on Windows 7 or Windows 8 or whatever you have in your uh, in your system. Uh, the second issue is user ability. So one way to uh, to tackle software and s bringing softwares to user is to have the users install them on their own, but then you need to know that the users are actually able to do that. And there may be some presets that you want, like templates for the Office package or pre-installation for, for email services or whatever it is. Uh, another issue or aspect that's come up in recent years is application availability because we see that users are more and more experienced uh, or more and more um, expecting to have their applications and basically their work stuff available from e from anywhere and uh, using different platforms different computers and so on and so forth so they don't want to li be limited to uh, to to the applications that I have installed on their physical uh, office desktop for instance and uh, then there is also a licensing issue and uh, licenses are always hard and well beyond the scope of this lecture but uh, you can use uh, clever ways of delivering software to users that makes you able to avoid some licensing uh, obstacles so moving on to some of the different uh, options that we have uh, this is definitely not co covering all of them or going into depth uh, in some way uh, the first one that we have, which has been traditionally used in the Windows, uh, in the world of Windows, is automatic installation. And this is basically where you store uh, installers on a file server, and then you make, uh, and, and then you make so that the applications are either installed automatically when the user logs on to a computer for the first time, or, or you can uh, configure it so that the users can be uh, can uh, install the applications on demand. Uh, so this is this is uh, quite comfortable because it's controllable. Be uh, you, as a system administrator, configure everything, and you know what, go what what's going on, and it's somewhat easy to configuring. Uh, the the difficulties begins when you're looking at, f for instance, the licensing can be a nightmare here, as as it always is, but you you get. Um, you, you get really platform dependent. So if you have software that needs to run on different platforms or different versions of Windows, for instance, then you may need to have different installer packages for each and every one of those versions and so on and so forth. Um, also, the user availability is rather low when you look at the modern options because uh, the installation will only work on domain joined computers. Uh, 
so going into the modern world, we have a third-party solution which is called Docker, which I've heard will be uh, will actually be integrated into Windows Server. So that's a good thing. Uh, and what Docker basically is that is that it creates uh, containers that. Uh, that contains the application that you want and all the uh, dependencies for that application and then it virtualizes the platform sort of in its own little sandbox and that makes it able to run more independent of the platform. Um, the good thing with this is that you get a good user experience because the user doesn't really have to install the applications they just run a pre-created uh, docker container um, you also get platform version independence because, it, uh, at least from the user perspective, because you, as a system administrator, just create those containers and provide those to the users. And this is a third-party tool, so you can uh, could consider the costs, both in terms of licensing, but also in terms of uh, having a need for uh, competence uh, when it comes to Docker. It may not be something that you're uh, system administrators know about since before, so it's something that you either have to learn, send people to courses or whatever, uh, or pay for it as a service. Uh, then, if we look on uh, look towards cloud services, we have the concept of software as a service, which is abbreviated SaaS, uh, and this basically means that you buy access to software that is located uh, on a cloud service. And this is, uh, for instance, Google Docs or uh, Office 365 are developed as uh, or delivered as cloud services. So what you, what you need to do is basically buy a buy a package where and enable your users to log on, log in to some web portal, and then they can use the uh, use the services. What's good with this is that you have complete platform independence. All you need is a web browser, and then you can access it. Uh, you also have total availability because it's up to the service uh, deliverer to uh, to make the applications available, and they will be available no matter if the if the user is accessing the service from their work desktop or from their home laptop or from a uh, from a, a pad or something uh, from the sysadmin perspective it's also low maintenance because you don't have to do anything except from buying it uh, but however but you can look at the, at the cons which is that it, it's costly because you have to pay a monthly fee uh, you don't have enough offline access, which you will have uh, within your company. Uh, if someone cuts the, uh, if someone cuts the uh, the internet access, you will have access to all the applications that you host internally in your network. But if you go with software as a as a service, you're really getting dependent on that uh, on that internet connection. You can also uh, start talking about how files are actually stored, where user data is stored. For instance, is it stored in the cloud or which brings security concerns, or is it stored locally, and how do you make um, a cloud service store data locally on your file server that, it ho that is hosted within your network? Um, and what data will it leak? Who has, who has access to the data? I know, for instance, that Azure um, at the moment, which is the Microsoft Cloud Service, doesn't allow you uh, to store data in Sweden because they don't have a server park in Sweden for, for Azure. And that's, of course, a concern because what happens to my data? Does Microsoft have access to it? Do I follow legal requirements if I'm storing sensitive data in a place that I don't know about? And how does this comply with GDPR and, and, and stuff like that? Uh, however, it's a great service, very much used and usable for personal use, uh, but you should consider those security things if you're trying to, uh, or if you want to deploy it as a company service. Um, so, uh, sort of a middle way here is something called Remote Apps, which is a Windows Server feature that is in some way uh, similar to uh, using software as a service, but you can configure it internally on a server that can be physically attached to your domain, and the user can then access apps via a web browser. Uh, what we're essentially doing with m remote apps is that we're making use of the remote access technology that is built into Windows and we're basically configuring a feature where the users can uh, access the server remotely and be presented to a slimmed down version of that server which only contains the application that we decided to, uh, to put out to the user. Uh, so the pros here is that we do get a complete platform independence because we are uh, we can deliver the uh, 
we we'll get a high level of platform independence at least because we can deliver the applications as uh, as uh, uh, through our web portal portal we also get the high availability because we're free to uh, well to let anyone log in to our web server if we want to um, the, the negative side of it if you compare it to software as a service is that it needs more managing from our side um, and we don't get the offline access because uh, if you install office the office package on your normal computer all you need is to be able to start a computer and there it is with the remote applications we still need to be connected to a network which can be a drawback however if we run it internally at least at least we're not that dependent on the computer being uh, able to access the internet now as for the platform independence side of things that's not completely true because the applications are actually sort of running on the server where we install it so the application has to be able to uh, be installed on the on the remote apps server however it can run independently of the client um, so you can't go install some uh, some fancy Linux uh, thing on your server and expect that to work because it can't be installed on the Windows server however if you can install it on the Windows server it should be accessible by the clients um, so that's what I just said uh, and we can configure remote apps in a number of different ways. The way that I'm using for the sake of this presentation is pres accessing the applications via web browser. We can also make the user access the application uh, using remote the remote desktop application if we would like to. Yeah, just, just this information. Uh, so, uh, to install remote apps there are some steps that we need to take. Uh, the first thing that we need to do is install something that is called session-based desktop deployment. Uh, and what we're essentially setting up here is a remote access gateway so the users can remote access to the server and they will be presented to a lightweight remote machine that contains the application that we want. Uh, the next thing we need to do is create a software collection and this is basically the container for the applications that we want to share. Uh, then we sh install the software locally on the server uh, and finally we add it to our collection and set access permissions as required by the setup that we want. Uh, so this way the users can access the applications by using a, um, a web browser and if we want to make the life a little bit easier for our users we can also create a group policy object that creates a desktop shortcut for, for easy access. Um, and that's it for the lecture part. Now we're going to uh, try to embark on a short demonstration of how this works. So I had to do some cutting because I was uh, accidentally almost showing you my inbox and I don't want to do that on YouTube. Uh, so we're back on our server which is uh, actually my domain controller but it can be any server that is joined to the domain and what we need to do now is begin with installing the session based desktop deployment and we do that by doing as we always do when we want to add things in Windows Server 2012. We go to the server manager we go to manage and we go to add roles and features. Um, then we should. This is not a role-based or feature-based installation. So instead, we're going to select remote desktop services installation. Uh, in the next step, we can choose to either go standard deployment or quick start. And in this case, we're going to go quick start because it helps us do a lot of a lot of the things that we're going to do in in a nice and easy, quick way. So. Quick start is good in some cases. Then we go next and we can choose either to install it in a virtual machine based setting or a session based desktop setting. Uh, and the difference here is that with the virtual machine way, um, then we uh, let the users actually have virtual desktops and basically connect to the, uh, to the, uh, to the system and be presented with what would look almost like a computer. With a session-based desktop uh, deployment, we let the user select only to uh, only to the programs that we that we select, and they will get a session-based desktop that only contains w the applications that we want them to have. And so we're going with session-based. I've already done that, so uh, you're going to have to click th through the guide on your own. You should note that you will not be allowed to proceed with the installation if there is a pending update or pending restart or something like that. Uh, so I'm going to cancel here and I'm 
I'm going to show you the next step, which is to create a software collection. And after the installation is done, you will get the remote desktop services choice here in the left of your server manager. So we can click there. And then we get a little overview. And in the overview, we can click on further to see that the servers that are involved. And we can see an overview of our collections. And if you want to create a new one, you would just go up to tasks at the far right, and then you can go tasks and create session con collection. So we, we might as well do that. Um, when you do that, uh, you just have to follow a guide where you set a name. You have to show uh, what server that is supposed to be the host for this one, and your server uh, will be listed here. I've already collected uh, create a collection for on my server, so I'm, I'm quitting this guide, and then you can see here that I have a collection that is called My Apps, and I'm going to go into that. You can see that it also appears on the left here, and then you can see that there is a properties pane on top here. And if I go task uh, edit properties, you can see all the different properties that you can set during the creation dialogues. So apart from the name, you should be aware of the groups. And the user groups here are the groups of users that are, are allowed to access this collection at all. Uh, and then there is also some other security and session limitations and load balancing and stuff that you can you can set. Uh, there is also something that is called a uh, user's profile disk that we don't need if we're just going to share um, share applications but if you want the users to sort of have a default way to a default place to save data uh, you can create that here it could be a shared folder or something like that and uh, so moving away and uh, when we have our software collection it's going to be empty the next thing we have to do is install software locally on the server and then add it to our collection uh, as you can see down here I've already added Google Chrome Chrome and if I go to the properties you see that there are some things that, that I can do uh, I can select the icon I can decide if the if this p particular application should be shown in the RD web access which is what the users will see if they go to to the web web access for this and there are some uh, parameters that I can set like if I allow command line parameters or not uh, and I can choose what users to assign this uh, application to so the default setting is that this application is shared to all users that can access the uh, this collection which is domain users uh, and I'm just going to go to my client again and show you how this works. So if I go to the client and open up a web browser, I can now visit my collection by going HTTPS uh, colon, okay, I will do it the easy way, apps, which is the host name for the server, dot do 9 joaka dot local, which is my domain name, and then RD web to get to the remote desktop web service and when I do that I get a warning because my certificate isn't valid but I will go on to the web page anyway and I can log in with a domain user I have one called Nini so I log in with her account and you can see that here is Google Chrome Chrome and now I can click Google Chrome I can go open I'm prompted for the password again now you see that I'm connected to my server here, and I have Google, Google Chrome uh, up and running, even if it's not installed on the local computer. Um, so, uh, next thing I want to show you just real quickly is to how to add another application to the remote apps. So I'm back on the server, uh, back in my collection here, and in the remote app program section here in the middle, I can go task, and publish remote apps, remote app programs. What happens now is that I basically get a list of all the programs that are available for for sharing. And I'll see if I have something fun. Um, I had a plan for doing something that's at least a little bit interesting, but let's just go with a calculator. Uh, so I go calculator, and then I go publish, and it's going to take us just a little short while. 
uh, but then it's going to be published. So going back to the client, you can see that if I just update the site here, now I can use the calculator as well. Um, however, at times you want to uh, select on the user basis or group basis what application to present to what user, and you can do that if you just right click one of the applications here and go edit properties then you can go to the user assignment and select to only share it with specific users and groups so in for this instance I'm going to add here and I'm going to add do economy which is Swedish for economy and I'm going to go apply uh, and if I go look in my active directory you can see that the uh, Nila Nilsson, who is Nini, is uh, not a is not a member of the economy group. So now that that is applied here, you can see that if I go back to the client and update here, then the calculator should disappear. So that's a short introduction to remote apps, which is a Windows way to to share applications with the users. Uh, I hope you learned something and had a good experience and uh, I hope that you try it out on your own. Thanks for this. My name is Joachim Scherrestad from the University of Skövde.